Welcome to the Salem Athenaeum. I'm Diane Stern, a trustee. A reminder that if you have questions, and I bet you will have a lot of them, uh, they should be put in the chat feature or you could put them in a, the Q&A. We're in that format now, it's a webinar format. And make sure that you are muted, please. We're excited to have you all join tonight's program, which at the very least might make you wanna go back to your required high school and college reading assignments, Shakespearean plays. Only now with this book and this discussion tonight of North by Shakespeare, You'd read them knowing that a 16th century courtier just might be behind those masterworks. This happened to our guest. Michael Blanding is a Boston-based investigative journalist. His work has appeared in the New York Times, the Boston Globe Magazine, and other publications. He wrote the New York Times bestseller, The Map Thief, the gripping story of an esteemed rare map dealer who made millions stealing priceless maps. Michael is a former writing fellow at Brandeis, the Kennedy School at Harvard, and is taught at Tufts and Emerson. We are delighted to have you join us. Michael, welcome virtually to the Salem Athenaeum. Thank you so much, Diane, for that great introduction. And, and uh, thank you for uh, hosting uh, my talk tonight about my book, North by Shakespeare. And uh, I'm so sorry that I can't be at the Athenaeum in, in person after seeing that beautiful video. But of course, as we know, COVID had other plans, but uh, really wonderful to be there virtually at least. And uh, I'm gonna bring a, a little bit of Salem into my talk tonight. Uh, usually I end my talk with a reading from my book, but uh, tonight instead I have uh, a, a video that's uh, prepared by the uh, scholar that I that I write about, and uh, it has to do with Macbeth and and uh, of course the witches. So there's a little uh, Salem connection. We'll have some some witches in, in the room with us tonight as well. Uh, I am going to share my screen here, and uh, hopefully this will work okay. All right, hopefully you can. I'll see that. Uh, all right, so I am going to uh, talk for a little bit about my book, North by Shakespeare. I'll talk for about a half an hour or so and uh, tell you a little bit about this uh, fascinating new theory about uh, Shakespeare's plays and about the rogue scholar uh, who is uh, proposing this theory, Dennis McCarthy. And uh, then, as I say, I will uh, close out with a the, with the short video uh, exploring some aspects of, of that theory. Okay, so we all know William Shakespeare as the author of the greatest works in the English language, and there is no denying the profound impact that those works have had on our culture, whether it's the wit of Falstaff or Beatrice, the heroism of Rosalind or Prince Hal, or the villainy of Richard III, Iago, or Lady Macbeth. Shakespeare has created indelible characters that have continued to influence us 400 years later. In fact, it's fair to say that no one else has been reinterpreted, adapted, parodied, or translated as much as Shakespeare has. And indeed, the 38 plays that bear his name may be the closest that we have to a shared culture around the world. It's been said that at every moment in time, someone is performing Shakespeare somewhere around the globe, and uh, that's only been slightly less true during the pandemic when Zoom Shakespeare has really become a thing. For all that we celebrate Shakespeare's works, however, it's surprising that we actually know very little about Shakespeare the person. We know that he was born in 1564 in Stratford-upon-Avon, upon avon was the son of a glove maker, and was later a part owner in the Globe Theatre and the Lord Chamberlain's Men in London. About half the plays that bear his name appeared during his lifetime, and the other half appeared in the first folio after his death in 1616. For all that we know about William Shakespeare, though, it might be a better question than who was Shakespeare to ask who wasn't Shakespeare. For all we know, he had no college education. He didn't study the law. He had no, Italian, uh, no knowledge of Italian or other foreign languages. In fact, as Ben Johnson famously said, he had small Latin and less Greek. 
Uh, there's no records of him fighting in any wars or traveling outside of England or even the, the axis of London and Stratford. Uh, no familiar with the nobility, as far as we know, aside from perhaps presenting plays at court, and no books or musical instruments that were left in his will. And this real gap in, in knowledge of Shakespeare, and more importantly, this gap in the experience and education that would seem to be required to write these amazing plays has caused many people over the decades and centuries to question whether Shakespeare wrote the plays at all. And they have put forward theories that someone else actually wrote the plays and under a pseudonym. For example, Sir Francis Bacon or Christopher Marlowe, Henry Neville, Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, or even a woman such as Mary Sidney, Amelia Bassano, or Queen Elizabeth herself. And you can forgive people for coming up with these theories that may seem uh, you know, a bit like conspiracy theories or a bit outlandish to us, uh, just because of this, as I say, gap in knowledge and education, but more importantly, the experiences that would really re be required to write about uh, you know, plays set in Italy or plays in which there's, there's uh, intimate uh, knowledge of the language of war or legal situations, et cetera, et cetera. You don't have to be a conspiracy theorist, however, to know that the stories themselves uh, were not created by Shakespeare. Uh, for example, um, or as uh, Bill Bryson has said, uh, Shakespeare is a wonderful teller of stories so long as someone else had told them first. And uh, for example, his plays uh, are based on stories in Italian novellas, in the English histories of Holinshed and Hall, and on the Greek and Roman biographies in the books Plutarch's Lives, translated by Sir Thomas More. And in fact, many scholars have put forth the theory that Shakespeare has used lost plays to write his works as well, that he's actually adapted earlier versions of some of his plays, which isn't uh, that surprising because of the 3,000 or so plays from the Elizabethan and Jacobean era, we only have about 10% that, that survive today. But others, we know about their names, we know when they were published, we even know a little bit about their plots. And scholars have speculated, for example, that a play called Phoenicia may have influenced Much Ado About Nothing. Philemon and Philistia may have been the source for Two Gentlemen of Verona. A play called Titus and Vespasian may have inspired Titus Andronicus. There's the Jew of Venice and the Merchant of Venice, an early version of Hamlet called the Ur Hamlet, even Romeo and Juliet, there are references to a play uh, based on the Romeo and Juliet story as far back as 1562, 30 years before Shakespeare is presumed to have written his work. And then there are other plays that we might call companion plays that do exist today that have similar names to Shakespeare's dramas, uh, similar characters, similar plots. And it's an open question among scholars whether these plays inspired Shakespeare, whether Shakespeare inspired them, or whether they were both inspired by, again, now lost plays. The scholar that I uh, profile in my book, North by Shakespeare, is a man by the name of Dennis McCarthy. And he has proposed a unique answer to this Shakespeare authorship question. He believes that Shakespeare indeed had a source play for almost every one of his dramas. Where he departs from conventional scholars, however, and when, where he becomes quite controversial, is that he believes they were all written by the same person, Sir Thomas North, who I, as I just mentioned, was the translator uh, most famously of the book Plutarch's Lives. Uh, this actually is not an actual portrait of Thomas North. Uh, there's actually no surviving extant portrait, so I actually had one created by a sketch artist for, for my book. But, um, but before you start uh, sort of slowly backing away and turning off your Zoom, uh, thinking that I'm going to sort of, you know, fly you with, with some crazy conspiracy theory, let me assure you that when Dennis first told me about this theory, I didn't believe it either. I thought that uh, it was really outlandish. You know, I was an English major. I'd always believed that Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare and that was the end of the question and that there was really nothing more to it. But uh, as Dennis uh, gave me more information and uh, started showing me a lot of the evidence that he had, he had amassed, uh, I started becoming more and more convinced. And, and I leave it as an open question towards the end of my book, but uh, 
I think that uh, the wealth of evidence that he has put forward shows that he's at least, at the very least, onto something uh, really, really incredible that scholars uh, should take seriously and could really change the way that we view Shakespeare and Shakespeare's plays. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, one of the first pieces of evidence that he showed me is a lost Elizabethan manuscript uh, by the name of A Brief Discourse of Rebellion and Rebels by a courtier named George North, uh, who was probably a cousin of Thomas North. And Dennis uncovered this in the British Library. Scholars didn't even know it existed. And he was able to use plagiarism software, this computer software that can compare different texts to each other. And using that software, he determined that this lost manuscript was a source for 11 of Shakespeare's plays, including King Lear, Macbeth, Henry V, and Richard III, some of his, uh, his greatest uh, plays, and even inspired some of his greatest soliloquies, like the Winter of Our Discontent soliloquy from Richard III. Um, when he revealed this information uh, in this book, A Brief Discourse of Rebellion and Rebels, which he published with his co-author, uh, June Schluter, scholars were amazed and they uh, were um, all effusive in their praise of Dennis. The, uh, the director of the Shakespeare Folger Library called this a once in a generation, if not several generations, fine. New sources for Shakespeare do not come, come along very often now, hundreds of years after the plays were written. And in fact, uh, by this point, I had been uh, talking with Dennis for a few years after he first approached me. And I wrote an article for the New York Times about this discovery called Plagiarism Software Unveils a New Source for 11 of Shakespeare's Plays. And this story made the front page in the newspaper. It got spread all over the world. It got picked up by all kinds of other media. And again, scholars were really um, very effusive in their praise of Dennis. Dennis, however, does not believe that George North, I'm sorry, that Shakespeare ever read this manuscript by George North. And this is where it starts getting interesting. Dennis believes that George's cousin, Thomas North, used this manuscript to write these plays along with source plays for uh, almost every other one of Shakespeare's works. And that he later sold these to Shakespeare. Shakespeare otherwise acquired them and adapted them and rewrote them to his own plays. So he doesn't believe that Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare. He does believe that Shakespeare wrote the plays, but he believes that they were based on these now lost source plays. Now, I am an investigative journalist and um, this kind of question is uh, really, uh, really right up my alley in terms of trying to uh, investigate it and determine if it's true. What fascinated me in particular is that when Dennis put forward his theory about the George North manuscript, scholars were over the moon. They were, you know, saying that he had really uncovered something incredible. But he, at the same time, he'd been trying to get out his bigger theory about Thomas North. And it's so close to this idea that Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare, that one person was responsible for all of these plays, that they um, just kind of laughed him uh, out of town and, and dismissed it out of hand. And as an investigative reporter, I, I asked myself, how could both things be true? How could they be full of praise for him one moment and then completely dismiss him the other moment? Um, just to, enough about me, I uh, have been a journalist for over 20 years. I've written for Boston Magazine, the Boston Globe, the New York Times. I've written two books. My first book is uh, The Coke Machine, and it's an expose of the Coca-Cola Company looking at health, human rights, and environmental issues. So I'm not afraid to take on some sacred cows, to say the least. My latest book is called The Map Thief, and it's about a thief of rare antiquarian maps. It's a nonfiction book in which I looked at both the history modern day narrative of these thefts, as well as the historical narrative of these maps and map makers. So this kind of question is one that is really uh, fascinating to me. And I saw an opportunity with this book to do something similar where I could write about the modern day narrative of Dennis trying to convince anyone to believe him in this theory. At the same time, I could go back in time and look at Thomas North's life, look at the plays and do my own investigation to see if perhaps there was any merit to what he was putting forth. And I could not have been luckier in my uh, subject for the book, Dennis McCarthy. He is not your ordinary scholar. And uh, he was really fun to write about because he is quite the iconoclast. He uh, did not graduate from college. He, he uh, left college a few, short, uh, few credits short of a degree, uh, became a writer and spent a lot of his 20s actually playing uh, professional Frisbee semi-professionally. So he's uh, definitely not your kind of cut and dried Shakespeare scholar material. 
But he is someone who is incredibly smart. He's a real polymath and autodidact who can really delve in deep to subjects that interest him. And before he investigated Shakespeare, he actually looked at a topic called biogeography, which examines how plant and animal species move and evolve around the world. And he wrote peer reviewed papers in scientific journals, and he wrote a book for Oxford University Press about this topic, which was very widely acclaimed. And it was actually this subject that turned him on to Shakespeare, interestingly enough. He had spent all this time looking at how plant and animal species move around the world. And he asked himself, could he do the same thing with a story and, and trace how a story moves from different cultures around the world? And with a sort of maximum amount of hubris, he decided that the story that he was going to focus on was uh, probably the most famous story ever told, Shakespeare's Hamlet. Now, before Shakespeare wrote his famous play, the legend of Hamlet uh, was uh, several hundred years old. It was originally a Norse uh, legend uh, about Prince Amleth in the 11th century. It travels to England through a French version before Shakespeare writes his uh, version in the first quarter of 1603. But as I mentioned before, before Shakespeare's version, there was another version of the play that's referenced in several works that scholars now call the Ur Hamlet. And it is referenced as far back as 1589, about 15 years before Shakespeare's play. Some scholars believe that maybe Shakespeare was the author of the Ur Hamlet because uh, uh, you know, that, and then he just adapted it later and, and rewrote it uh, into the play that we know today. But it really doesn't make a lot of sense because 1589 would have been just at the beginning of Shakespeare's writing career. And how could he have written such a masterpiece at that time? And so other scholars have proposed other potential authors for this play. Maybe it was written by Thomas Kidd or Christopher Marlowe or someone else. And Dennis uh, McCarthy said to himself, um, I, I think that I can figure this question out. I think I can do the research, I can look at these references, and I can puzzle out who wrote the Ur Hamlet. And for example, he started looking at all of these sort of satirical references by different authors, such as uh, some by Thomas Nash, in which he talks about uh, the Ur Hamlet, and he refers to translators, who, uh, and he refers to, to Plutarch, and, and again, Thomas North translated Plutarch's lives, and he uses phrases like, get Boreas by the beard, and Boreas is the North Wind. And so all of these references and many others then started looking at, and they all started, started pointing at Sir Thomas North, which was interesting because North had never been recognized as a playwright or a poet, uh, much less as the author of Hamlet. But Dennis started reading Thomas North's works, and he started with his first translation, a book called The Dial of Princes, which he wrote in 1557. And about halfway through the book, he found a passage, it was a meditation on death, which seemed like it was just a spitting image for Shakespeare's famous soliloquy in Hamlet with the be or not to be soliloquy. For example, Thomas North asks, is it better that thou die or that thou escape and live? To be or not to be, that is the question. He talks about the assaults of life and broils of fortune, just as Hamlet talks about the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. They both talk about a sea of troubles and death as a kind of sleeping. Thomas North calls it a pilgrimage uncertain. Hamlet calls it an undiscovered country. And in these and many other uh, phrases in parallel between these two passages, Dennis thought that he had found the source for this soliloquy in Hamlet. And again, it pointed towards Thomas North. And many of these phrases actually had, had not been uh, used by anyone else in English. He was able to look at online databases and find that they were unique to Thomas North and Hamlet. So that was very interesting. But as he started investigating it more, he started finding more and more references to North in these historical documents that seem to reference other plays by Shakespeare as well. And eventually he started using this uh, computer plagiarism software. He took all of Thomas North's writing, about a million words, and all of Shakespeare's plays, again, about a million words, and he ran them all through the software and it lit up like a Christmas tree, thousands and thousands of phrases in common, uh, three words, four words, up to eight words in common, which statistically is uh, really rare and unusual. And again, many of these phrases were unique in English. And uh, you know, it's maybe not surprising that there were some uh, phrases in common between Shakespeare's uh, Roman plays, which are based on Plutarch's lives written by Thomas North. But even these plays, it was just amazing how 
close these passages follow. You can see everything in red here is in common between Thomas North on the left and Shakespeare on the right. And it's just like lit up in red. And it's almost like Shakespeare is taking Thomas North's work and just uh, transforming the prose into poetry for his play. And this is uh, a way that Shakespeare works with no other writer. Uh, the same thing you can see in Julius Caesar and in Coriolanus, the other Roman plays where again, these whole passages are just kind of transcribed into the plays. What was really interesting to Dennis, however, and uh, what I find uh, really incredible is that it wasn't just the Roman plays and it wasn't just Plutarch's lives, but it was nearly every one of Shakespeare's plays and nearly uh, in all of Thomas Norse writing. So this is, um, Thomas, uh, this is Dennis's website here. Uh, I know you can't read this, it's scrolling by really fast, but I just wanna give you a sense for the number of passages that Dennis found in common. This is just a small fraction of the passages in the plays that seem to be directly taken from Thomas North's writing. And it's not just common phrases that might, you know, uh, you could say that, that uh, you know, Shakespeare could have just taken those phrases from anyone, but there are whole passages that have multiple phrases in common and even express some of the same ideas in some of the same language. And that is really, uh, that's where it really starts to get unique. And so Dennis concluded that either one or two things was true. Either Shakespeare is obsessed with Thomas North and has his books open before him when he's writing his plays, every one of his plays, or indeed Thomas North wrote early versions of these plays that Shakespeare adapted. And he even found some evidence for that later uh, supposition in another work of the period called Green's Groat's Work of Wit which is sort of famous among scholars for being one of the first references to Shakespeare to appear in print. Uh, he's referred to as shake scene and the phrase is used a tiger's, rap, a tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide, which is a reference to uh, Shakespeare's uh, Henry VI part two. And this uh, passage refers to Shakespeare as an upstart pro who beautifies himself with the feathers of others, which was a common expression for plagiarism or copying other people's work at the time. And so it's notable that the first reference to Shakespeare that appears in print accuses him of being a plagiarist. Now, of course, the idea of plagiarism didn't exist back in Shakespeare's time the way it exists now. It was actually very common to take other people's work, rewrite it, rework it, and put your own name on it. But um, this, whoever wrote this screen's growth work of wit seemed to be implying that Shakespeare did this to a uh, uncanny and, and unfair degree. And if you keep reading the work, uh, there's actually this exchange between this country actor that could be Shakespeare and this gentleman scholar in which um, very explicitly the actor says that uh, men of my profession get by scholars their whole living. And that scholar says, but how do you mean to use me? And the actor says, why sir, in making plays for which you will be well played, well paid. And so Dennis um, believed that he was actually seeing a representation of Shakespeare buying these plays from Thomas North that he would later adapt into his own. And indeed, a lot of the details about the gentleman scholar in the work seem to relate in really uncanny ways with Thomas North's life. So who is Thomas North? Who's this man that uh, Dennis is saying is behind the plays? Well, he was raised a gentleman in Kirtling Hall in Cambridgeshire. He was the son of a lord in the time of Henry VIII. His brother uh, inherited the title as a, uh, as a lord who was uh, high up in the uh, court under Queen Elizabeth. So Thomas North would have brushed shoulders with nobility and, and uh, the upper classes all the time. As a second son, however, he um, uh, was uh, uh, in, in the field of letters, he was a translator of these works, The Dial of Princes, as I mentioned, Plutarch's Lives, as I mentioned. He also wrote this other book of animal fables called The Moral Philosophy of Doni. And towards the end of his life, he, he wrote sort of an addendum to Plutarch's Lives called Nepos's Lives, which had more lives, basically. But he also lived this incredible life himself as a lawyer, as a soldier who fought in Ireland and the Netherlands, and a diplomat to France and Italy. And so you start to see all of these elements in Shakespeare's plays that could be explained by referring to the life and work of Thomas North, that here is someone who had the requirements to write Shakespeare's plays. He had the education, he had the experience, he had the contact with nobility, and, and especially he had the travel to Italy, which is um, you know, so present in, in Shakespeare's plays. 
In addition, he was disowned by his brother later in life for reasons which are a little bit unclear and, and died impoverished. And so it could have actually provided some explanation for why he might have sold these plays to Shakespeare to be adapted. There were other uh, uh, references in Thomas North's life, however, that seemed to more specifically be included in the plays. And I'll just give you some examples of these. In 1551, Thomas North's half-sister, Alice Arden, murdered her husband. Uh, Thomas Arden, it was sort of the murder of the century. It was uh, an incredible crime for the time that a woman would rise up against her husband and, and commit murder like this. So much that, that four, century, four decades later, people were still talking about it. And there was a play written about it called Arden of Faversham. It was an anonymous play but many uh, scholars today believe that it was Shakespeare's first work. And uh, because of the similarity with Shakespeare's other plays, and uh, in the Oxford Shakespeare today, it's actually uh, attributed to Shakespeare. It's attributed officially to Anonymous and Shakespeare. And in addition, this work is seen by many as one of the main inspirations for Macbeth. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Macbeth uh, again towards the end of my talk. But when Dennis looked at Arden of Faversham, he found more than a thousand phrases in common just between this play and Thomas North's Dial of Princes. Even the subheading of the play itself, wherein is showed the great malice and dissimulation of a wicked woman, seems to be reflected in Thomas North's Dial, where he says, wherein is expressed the great malice and little patience of an evil woman. Just a few words off in 13 words, and no one has put great malice and wicked or evil woman together. Uh, anywhere else in the English language. Uh, just as significantly, in Norris' own copy of the Dial of Princes, which is at Cambridge University Library, which he signed and dated 1591, a year before Arden of Aversham came out, he actually underlined this passage in his own book and he wrote The Great Malice and Little Patience of an Evil Woman in the margin. In 1555, Thomas North travels to Italy on a delegation to Rome to reconcile England with the Pope. And along the way, he witnesses these lifelike wax statues in a church outside Mantua. That same day, he goes to a palace in Mantua and he sees these amazing frescoes by the artist Giulio Romano, full of gods and goddesses at a pastoral feast. Why is this significant? In Shakespeare's play, The Winter's Tale, it also features a wax statue that famously comes to life at the end of the play that was made by that rare Italian master, quote, Giulia Romano, the only Renaissance artist mentioned in Shakespeare's plays. And this same play also features a pastoral feast with these pagan gods and goddesses, which there's really no explanation for why these two very disparate images would be combined. But Thomas North actually saw them both in the same day. And that's the reason we know that is because Dennis found the journal that Thomas North kept on this journey in which he describes his experiences in Mantua, describes going to this church and having dinner at the Palazzo Te, viewing these uh, famous frescoes. And Dennis published the journal along again with his co-writer, June Schluter, in a book and talks about how this um, journal uh, is related to The Winter's Tale as well as the play Henry VIII, which he also believes that he wrote at that time, uh, the source play for Shakespeare's Henry VIII. Um, and I'll just say one word about uh, Dennis's co-author, June Schluter, who wrote both of these books with him. Uh, you know, as I said before, uh, Dennis has had a real difficult time getting scholars to believe in him. And June is the one exception. She is a professor emerita at Lafayette College. She was the former editor of a Shakespeare journal. She's the real deal when it comes to Shakespeare scholars. And alone among all of the scholars, she has really uh, been persuaded by his evidence is taking it seriously. And at the kind of core of my, my book, at the heart of my book is a sort of odd couple relationship between this very distinguished Shakespearean scholar who took a chance on this sort of brash upstart uh, rogue scholar, as I call him in the title, and uh, how they collaborated to get this information out to the world. Uh, I'll just say a little bit more about uh, the plays. Um, one other interesting aspect that Dennis has uncovered is that not only is Thomas North's life reflected in the play, but also the life of his patron, the Earl of Leicester, who is sort of uh, famously known as uh, Queen Elizabeth's favorite 
and spent uh, decades trying to woo Queen Elizabeth and become King of England himself, uh, unsuccessfully, unfortunately. But there's been a whole kinds of uh, romantic uh, sort of legends uh, about uh, you know the fact that maybe Elizabeth and Lester uh, secretly got together. But one thing is clear: Lester uh, tried everything he could to try to get Elizabeth to marry him. And he would often employ writers to write um, passages either puffing up Lester or dragging down any other suitors who tried to uh, woo Elizabeth. And Dennis believes that Thomas North was no exception to this and that he was actually a playwright for Lester's theater troupe, the Lester's Men, and that many of the plays have these sort of hidden attacks on the other suitors that were wooing Queen Elizabeth. Let me show you what I mean. In the 1560s, Queen Elizabeth was courted by Eric XIV of Sweden, whose official title was the King of the Swedes and the Goths. And in Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus, the villain is Tamora, Queen of the Goths. In the 1570s, she was courted by Don John of Austria, the bastard brother of King Philip of Spain. And the villain of Much Ado About Nothing is Don John, who's frequently referred to in the play as the bastard. And uh, most famously in the 1580s, for a long time, Queen Elizabeth was wooed by Francois Hercule, the Duke of Alençon and Anjou from France. And uh, many of Shakespeare's uh, history plays feature French villains, including the historical Duke of Alençon and uh, Margaret of Anjou, uh, who become the main villains of the Henry VI cycle of plays. And Dennis doesn't see these as coincidences. Um, you know, what is really fascinating about this is that in the 1590s, when Shakespeare was writing his plays, it would make no sense to make these people uh, his villains because um, Don John and the Duke of Alençon were both dead at that point. Eric the uh, 14th had gone mad and was deposed. And so there's really no reason for a playwright to hold them up and ridicule them. Again, Dennis believes that, that these are vestiges from Thomas Norris plays that he was writing decades earlier when it would have been very much uh, in his interest to write about these people uh, in order to uh, curry favor with the Earl of Leicester. And then uh, in 1575, uh, there was this sort of famous uh, festival that took place at Leicester's Castle of Kenilworth. And it was sort of the, uh, you know, the biggest party of the Elizabethan era. And uh, it went on for, for 14 days and there were barrels and barrels of beer and wine that were drunk and these amazing entertainments featuring uh, fireworks and performers of, of all kinds. It was a, you know, mechanical mermaid with a bunch of musicians sort of secreted inside that would put on these performances. And these were all, all arranged by the Earl of Leicester in order to woo Queen Elizabeth. And scholars have actually seen this festival as the inspiration for Shakespeare's most beloved play, A Midsummer Night's Dream. There's whole passages in A Midsummer Night's Dream that seem to refer to the specific entertainments that occurred in 1575 at Kenilworth. What's interesting though, is that Shakespeare was just 11 years old at the time, and it would have been very unlikely that he could have witnessed these entertainments himself. Whereas Thomas North was a gentleman, we know that his brother attended the festival and it's likely that Thomas North attended the festival as well and was inspired by that to write this, this play. So as I started talking with Dennis about all of these correspondences, both the textual correspondences, the biographical correspondences, again, I became more and more intrigued by the story and wanted to uh, tell it in, in a book form. The, um, you know, I, I said to him, look, I know you're having trouble getting your work out there. Um, you know, you're having trouble uh, being taken seriously. Why don't I write the book, you know, using my, uh, you know, whatever prestige I have as, as, a, as a journalist and uh, I'll follow you around. I will uh, investigate uh, your uh, attempts to get your work out there at the same time. I do my own investigation to see whether it might be true. Now, I thought it would be very boring, however, though, to just have a book that was kind of two guys sitting across the table just chatting about Shakespeare for 300 pages. So I came up with a way to tell this story to make it a little bit more interesting, which is that Dennis's daughter, Nicole, is a documentary filmmaker. She's worked for uh, the likes of Oprah and the Disney Channel. And uh, she has been working on a documentary about her dad for, for years to try to get his story out there as well. And I proposed to Nicole, I said, look, why don't we join forces 
why don't you make your documentary? I will write my book. We'll travel together. We'll go to England. We'll go to Italy. We'll walk in the footsteps of Thomas North along with your father and uh, have these conversations in the places where they actually occur. It'd be a way that I could really tell this, the story in a much more uh, hopefully interesting, exciting, and fun way for the reader. And so we did that. We went to uh, Palazzo Te in Mantua, uh, in that church uh, with the wax statues. You can see the excitement on Dennis's face as he sees them for the first time. Of course, we had to go to Venice, uh, where we explored some of the uh, possible uh, inspiration for Othello and, and uh, a merchant of Venice. We went to Kenilworth Castle and Kirtland Hall and all of these locations in England. And um, again, it was a way for me to tell the story as we were kind of walking along and sort of, you know, seeing these places that might have inspired Thomas North and having these conversations about how they might have actually uh, figured into Shakespeare's plays if Dennis's theories can be believed. At the same time, as a journalist, I didn't want to just sort of take what Dennis said for granted and just kind of parrot his own uh, beliefs. I wanted to do my own research as well. And I really loved going into the archives from the map thief and really looking at these rare maps and, and these historical documents myself. And so I wanted to do something similar. So I went to the archives in England. I spent a whole month in London. Uh, the summer before the pandemic hit, uh, thankfully, and uh, spent almost every day at the British Library, the National Archives, or the Bodleian Library in Oxford. And I looked at these historical documents with my own eyes. And what was surprising to me, um, as I relate in the book, is that in many cases, I started finding things that Dennis didn't even know about. For example, things that related to his father during the time of Henry VIII that seemed to relate to Shakespeare's plays. And I started asking myself and questioning as I was looking at these things, Am I just seeing what I want to see? Am I just drinking the Kool-Aid and just being persuaded by Dennis to you know, see what, what he sees? Or indeed, is there something really here? And um, the best example I can give uh, of this to you is that copy of The Dial of Princes by Thomas North and the marginalia that he had written in the margins of that copy. I've already showed you how he signed the copy in 1591 and underlined that passage from Arden of Faversham about the uh, great malice of, of an evil woman. But uh, as I started looking through this book myself and actually looking at the marginalia myself, um, much of which Dennis had not actually previously explored, surprisingly, even though he's a master at computer research, he hadn't gone into Cambridge Library and really looked at this himself. And I started finding all of these passages that seemed to relate to the play Macbeth. For example, I found this passage about uh, strange meats like fried frogs and lizards and broth, you know, which immediately conjured to mind the uh, witches at the beginning of Macbeth. And then I, I found this passage about a wicked man being compared to a candle, which it immediately made me think of Macbeth's famous soliloquy, which starts out, out, brief candle. But more to the point, um, it, the passage really refers to how an evil man once they're sort of, uh, once they start doing evil things, once the candle is lit, it will just burn out till it gets to the end. And what a better uh, metaphor, uh, you couldn't find a better metaphor for Macbeth in the plays. Once he commits that murder of King Duncan, he just commits evil act after evil act until he meets his own demise at the end of the play. And so I showed these to Dennis and I said, you know, I'm finding all these passages that really call to mind Macbeth. And Dennis and I had never even talked about Macbeth at that point. And it turned out that Dennis had sort of separately already uh, begun to believe that Thomas North had written his source play for Macbeth in 1592, the year after he'd written this marginalia. And the reason for that has to do with the witches. And it's because King James VI of Scotland, who would become King James I of England, uh, had a thing about witches. And uh, in, the, in 1591, he had sent for his bride, Anne of Denmark, and uh, on the way to Scotland, her ship had almost sunk. There's this huge storm that came up and the ship had almost sunk. And James was a superstitious person and he believed that this was witchcraft, that it was, uh, that there were witches that had created the storm in order to try to kill his bride. And he held a trial in this town of North Berwick in uh, 1592 uh, or 1591, I, some, somewhere around that period. And there were three witches that were tried for this crime of sinking the king's boat, and they were uh, convicted and, uh, and executed for this crime. 
And in fact, James even wrote a book called Demonology about witchcraft himself. He was very into uh, the occult and, and witches. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, he found uh, personally very fascinating. Um, what is um, really interesting though, is that the famous witches in Macbeth, the weird sisters that begin the play, when we first encounter them, what are they doing with their, uh, their cauldron full of rock? They're actually creating a storm to sink a ship. And so many scholars have come to the conclusion that the author of the play was actually inspired by these real life Berwick witch trials. This is a conventional scholarly interpretation that these are being referenced in the plays. Um, what's interesting though, is that the date for the classical date for the composition of Macbeth is 1605. And the trials, as I said, occurred in uh, 1591, I believe. So, you know, again, we're looking at almost 15 years earlier. And again, Dennis believes that it was actually Thomas North who was writing about this when it occurred and that it was then later adapted uh, into Shakespeare's play of Macbeth. And one of the reasons for this and one of the ways that it all comes together is in this association with Arden of Faversham. So you have Thomas North writing in his uh, copy of Dial of Princes in 1591, writing that marginalia that refers to both Macbeth and Arden of Faversham. You've got the play that's published in 1592, Arden of Faversham. And then you have these, these witchcraft trials that are occurring right around the same time. And Dennis believes that Thomas North was revising his play, Arden of Faversham, and at the same time working on this play, Macbeth. And what we're actually seeing in the Dial of Princes is his workbook for both of the plays in which he was writing in the margins. And uh, as I promised, I'm just gonna leave you with this video which Dennis made, it's on his website, uh, sirthomasnorth.com. And uh, he explains all this and ties it all together. And uh, hopefully uh, you'll find this as fascinating as I did. One of the most famous scenes in all of Shakespeare's plays is the horrific and suspenseful aftermath of the Macbeth's murder of King Duncan. But it is actually a historical. The Scottish royal murder that it is based on had none of those dramatic elements in which there's a knocking at the door. Wait, Lady Macbeth is yelling to go get water and wash away the blood. Got some water. Wash this filthy witness from your hand. Lady Macbeth expresses shame that she does not blush at the murder she just helped commit. The knocking adds fear of discovery. Hark, more knocking. They wish their victim were alive again. Wake Duncan with that knocking. And of course, the historical Lady Macbeth never really said, Out, damn spot, out, I say. Out. Damn spot out, I say. Or complained about her inability to wash away the it blood. There's the smell of the blood still. But while this never happened with the Macbeths, it did occur in precisely this manner with another murderous couple who were the subject of the true crime tragedy. Arden of Faversham. Like Lady Macbeth, Alice Arden had pushed her lover, Mosby, to murder an inconvenient man, her husband, Thomas Arden. On the night of the crime, as Alice and Mosby try to clean up the blood, there's a knocking at the door, threatening discovery. Hark and they knock in Arden of Faversham becomes Lady Macbeth's hark more knocking. Alice says, go, fetch some water and wash away this blood. As Lady Macbeth says, go get some water and wash this filthy witness from your hand. Alice and Lady Macbeth both express shame. They show no embarrassment at the crime. And there's a wish in each that the victim were alive again. But the most obvious resemblance involves Alice and Lady Macbeth's agonizing lament that they cannot wash away the blood. Here his blood remains, says Alice. Here's the smell of the blood still, says Lady Macbeth. And the blood will not out in Arden anticipates one of the most famous lines in the canon, out damn spot, out I say. Again in Arden, a guilty conscience leads to a nightmarish hallucination with grinning faces and hair bolted with blood and daggers in their hands. And this is clearly the inspiration of Macbeth's vision of the smiling face of blood bolted Banquo and the disembodied dagger with handle pointed toward his hand. And this is not original. Many scholars and editors have discussed still other passages in Arden of Feversham that link Alice and Mosby to Lady Macbeth and her husband. What does this have to do with Thomas North? Alice Arden, the real life Lady Macbeth, was North's half-sister, Mosby, a North family servant, and Thomas knew everyone involved in the crime.
But both tragedies are not just indebted to North's life, they also borrow from his personal writings. And all this comes together in the life of North in 1591 and 2. In 1591, North purchased a used 1582 edition of his own Dial of Princes. That's his signature right there. And then used it as a notebook for plays that he wrote or revised in the 1590s. Here, North underlines and writes out a chapter subtitle, which was then used as the subtitle for Ardner Feversham later that year, 1592. And according to both Ebo and Google, no one else in history has ever used this same language. The passages that North marked in his dial and then used for Ardner Feversham and Macbeth are just too many to relate here. So let us just focus on one, and it begins with another book of North's that he was also reviewing at this time. This passage from North's Moral Philosophy of Donny is not how it reads in Donny's original Italian. North has transformed the passage into his own language, adding images and phrases that turn Donny's prose into something more poetic. He has ensured that the language maintains a similar rhythm and that each particular idea or sentence segment are all about the exact same length. But the little world of our body and that little breath of ours once spent it is then but a shadow, dust, and smoke. It is but a fire kindled on the coals. And as Shakespeare scholars can already probably tell, that length is ten syllables. It's blank verse. This is blank verse. North has transformed an Italian prose passage into a blank verse soliloquy on the brevity and meaninglessness of life. And the passage should seem familiar. Turning back to the dial for a moment, Michael Blanding had sent me pictures of every marginal comment of Norse book and noted a number of them reminded him of Macbeth, including this one. And there it is, a wicked man is like a candle. And when we add it to our blank verse passage in Doni, we see a clear anticipation of one of the most famous soliloquies in history. North refers to the evil man who never ceases daily toward his demise, like a candle once light burning till the end. Macbeth describes time that creeps from day to day and life as lighted candle. North says life is then but a shadow. Macbeth says life's but a walking shadow. In North, it's a foolish life. Or in Macbeth, a thing of fools or an idiot. North describes life as a little breath quickly spent. Macbeth, a brief candle, soon out. North refers to death as dust. Macbeth, dusty death. And notice the rhythm. It is but a fire kindled on the coals. It is a tale told by an idiot. Finally, North notes that this foolish life has a wonderful presence. It radiates a glow and giveth heat. But then all cometh to nothing. Or, in the words of Macbeth, it is full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. North was reviewing his Donnie and Dial in 1591 and 2, marking passages relevant to Arden of Faversham, first published in 1592. This is the origin of Lady Macbeth's bloody hands, out, out, damn spot, the knocking, the visions of a dagger and blood boltered smiling faces. Also in 1591 to 2, Green and Marlowe wrote plays hoping to please James VI, the King of Scotland, future King of England. 1591 also saw the publication of News from Scotland about a trial of witches charged with creating a storm to destroy King James's ship. All of this comes together the same year in the life and writings of North. It's his half-sister and family servant, and he marked the passages for Macbeth and Arden in his own dial. And we can do this for every year, passage after passage, experience after experience, year after year, for over five decades. What are the most famous? All right, well, well, thank you very much for listening to my talk and, and hopefully uh, as that uh, video shows and as some of the other examples that I've, that I've given you show, you know, at least, the very least, there's something to uh, Dennis's theories that really deserves uh, more, uh, investigation and explanation. And, you know, I'll just leave you with one final thought, which is, you know, people ask me, you know, what does it matter who wrote Shakespeare's plays, whether it was Thomas North or the Earl of Oxford or Shakespeare himself. And uh, hopefully I've at least convinced you that it matters a great deal that knowing who the author was and knowing the experiences that have gone into the plays really do make them richer and, and make for a more satisfying uh, investigation of these really uh, incredible works of literature. So again, thanks so much for uh, listening to my talk and uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions that you might have about it. Wonderful, and thank you, Michael. This was fascinating, as is the book. Uh, I have a question. Uh, does Dennis McCarthy expect that someday that most 
Shakespearean scholars will come on board. I know you said there was buzz at one point and yeah, not yeah. so much now. Yeah, Dennis, Dennis is convinced that, you know, as, as Shakespeare would say, the truth will out eventually that, uh, you know, I, I think his one, um, you know, the, the one thing that makes it difficult for people to really swallow is the fact that none of these, quote, you know, none of these supposed source plays by Thomas North survive, and that there's no contemporary reference to Thomas North as a playwright, you know, those two things, I think, um, really uh, punch a hole in his theory, but you know, there's just so much of this circumstantial evidence from the life and from the text. And, and you know, really, I just scratched the surface, even in what I presented in my talk, that um, Dennis is convinced that, you know, it may take 100 years, but eventually this will be recognized as, as a theory about how Shakespeare wrote the plays. Is he still working on it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> in fact, um, yeah, I should put, a, a, you know, another plug for his website through thomasnorth.com. We also have a Facebook group that we created together about this. And, uh, it's amazed me how Dennis is uh, continuing to come up with new information. And he just uh, uncovered some passages in, in the Dial of Princes that seem to relate to Romeo and Juliet and, and uh, other things that, that I wasn't even able to put in the book. So uh, yeah, I don't think we've heard the last of this. So um, McCarthy is quite clear that he, he doesn't call this plagiarism. He doesn't want to think that it's a, a case of plagiarism. Right. So what yeah. is the distinction here? Yeah, and this is one of the confusions because he is using the plagiarism software and by today's standards, it's absolutely plagiarism. But that concept just didn't exist at the time. Um, you know, the word plagiarism didn't even enter the English language until a few years uh, uh, later. And, um, you know, what Dennis believes is that uh, Shakespeare was sort of taking these earlier works and just adapting the, them in the theater the same way that, you know, a, a film, uh, uh, writer might uh, adapt, you know, the way that Peter Jackson might adapt Lord of the Rings, for example, or, you know, the way that, uh, you know, you kind of take a work and you make it your own and you put your name on it, even though, uh, you know, it's essentially uh, based on another work. So it's sort of, you know, for, for Shakespeareans, um, you know, there's something really to embrace about this theory, unlike, say, theories about the Earl of Oxford or other people that, you know, it really does give Shakespeare some credit as an adapter of plays and as maybe a brilliant writer of his own, just not as the originator of the works. Um, I, I want to make sure that you, you see this comment from Francis Murphy. I cannot recommend the book more highly. It is part travelogue, part whodunit, and a lot about the Elizabethan times and the Shakespeare plays. A great read, even if you're not an authorship doubter, but a lover of the plays. There is an audible version that you can listen to while driving or doing <laughs> Have you heard the audible version? I have, and it's and it's excellent, actually. The, the reader, you know, takes a, a really uh, talented reader to be able to read kind of, you know, modern prose, but then also be able to read Shakespeare and, and the, uh, the reader of the audible version really knocks it out of the park. So I was really lucky. I'm curious, is it a Brit reading it? No, actually, <laughs> I thought that it would be sort of strange to have a, a British accent reading my my book because I'm an American and clearly it's told from an American perspective. So uh, I wanted to make it more accessible. So I, I actually, I had a little bit of a choice. They gave me some different uh, readers and one of them was British, but I opted to go with the American. I think it was the right choice. Uh, now we have some more questions if we can squeeze okay. them in. Uh, we're coming up to eight o'clock. Uh, this from uh, Jim Parmentier. Uh, will the Shakespearean scholars admit that the historical Shakespeare did not write the plays? Are they at least open to the question that the historical Shakespeare might not be the author? Um, in a simple answer, not really. <laughs> it's really been amazing to me since I've written this book. You know, even all the evidence that Dennis has put forward and that I put into the book, you think that people would at least. Um, at least engage with it, at least, uh, you know, treat it seriously, you know, even if only to debunk it. But, you know, what I've found is that most Shakespearean scholars, they have such a, an emotional attachment to the idea of Shakespeare as this genius, sole author of the work who sort of rose from his bootstraps in Stratford and became, you know, the greatest author in the English language, that it's very hard for them to really um, consider a different uh, conception of the authorship of the plays. And even one like this, which still gives Shakespeare credit. And so, um, you know, that's sort of a theme of my book as I look at actually uh, the reaction of the Shakespearean scholars and how, how June Schluter was convinced and these other ones were, weren't and, and, you know, what it really takes to change minds on, on a topic as, as emotionally laden as this. And, and I, as a journalist, I find those kind of questions fascinating. 
Absolutely. Um, Jean Marie, our executive director of the Salem Athenaeum, wants to know, have the companion plays or other existing Elizabethan plays been analyzed with the software? That's a good question. Um, I don't believe that they have. Um, people have certainly done uh, sort of textual analysis and, and, you know, for example, there's Taming of the Shrew and Taming of a Shrew, and people have done, you know, elaborate sort of parallel readings of them and figured out, you know, what's in each one of them. And I think the prevailing theory is that there is actually an Ur Shrew somewhere that, you know, used to exist that both of these plays sort of branched off and, and became their own versions of the plays. And of course, Dennis believes that Urshru was written by Thomas North and Shakespeare was just one of the adapters of it and somebody else adapted it too. But, um, but it's, a real, it's a real tangled thicket and, and I didn't even begin to try to, uh, you know, untangle that myself because it's, it's, you know, you look at all these different versions and what they have in common and uh, you very quickly become lost. Um, another question from Heather. Does Dennis think Thomas North may have had a female co-writer? As a woman and an actor, there are many female characters in their mm. words that feel as if those words could be only be written by a female. Heather says, as an actor myself, I've always felt that a female playwright has to have been involved. Yeah, well, that, that's a really fascinating idea. And um, he, do, he doesn't propose a female playwright, but one of Dennis's theories, which I, I didn't have time to get into is, um, that actually uh, Thomas Norris is very close to his daughter who actually uh, serves as the model for some of the heroines of Shakespeare's plays. And in fact, this has been independently proposed by other scholars that the, the character of Rosalind in As You Like It is actually uh, based on Elizabeth North, that uh, Rosalind is an anagram for Eliza Nord, friend, uh, Nord being the French uh, word for North, E E L I S A N O R D, and that when you you know uh, put that together, it becomes Rosalind, and um, that actually uh, Thomas North wrote this play about his very precocious uh, young daughter Elizabeth North, and and that that's one of the reasons why he believes that many of the female protagonists are so uh, so much more uh, developed than the uh, male protagonists of the plays. Okay, and if we could just squeeze this in, I know we're over eight o'clock, but. Uh, oh, sure. Who wrote the sonnets? Oh, <laughs> I knew someone was going to ask that question. <laughs> well, that actually provides a great teaser because um, the one thing that Dennis would not tell me in all of our travels together and all of our conversations together was anything about the sonnets. He said, I'm willing to tell you anything you want to know about the plays and you can scoop me and write about it before I, I can, but I'm going to keep the sonnets to myself. And he has a theory about them and it involves Thomas North. Uh, as well as apparently other writers, but to this day, I don't know what it is, and he has yet to reveal it to the world, which hopefully he will do soon, because I am curious about that myself. Oh, yes, yes, I'm sure much of the audience is as well. <laughs> yes. Well, I want to thank you so much. This has just been enlightening, and as I said earlier on, I think a lot of people are going to go back and reread Shakespeare with this yeah. knowledge, or at least this theory, and it will give them a different uh, point of view. I know that you you felt that too when you reread some of these, so. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It was really one of the pleasures of writing this book was a chance myself to go back and, and reread a lot of Shakespeare's plays and see them in new ways. So I really recommend it. Sure. Well, again, thank you so much. And thanks to everybody for joining us tonight. I think it was a great program. The book again is North by Shakespeare. Michael Blanding is our author. We hope to see you on another program in the coming years. We're always looking for great speakers, which you are one. And uh, thanks to all for looking at our video at the beginning of the show. We'd love you to entertain the notion of being a member of the Salem Athenaeum and take it from me. It's just a wonderful place with lots of good programs, events, and of course, books, 50,000 in our collection. Okay, have a good night, everybody. And thanks again, Michael. Thank you.